Fintech Corner. Uh, I'm Joseph Drambarian. I'm your host, and I am joined by the one and only Stop. Brett Turner. <laughs> Got to do it every time. Our founder and CEO here at Travada. And I have a topic that uh, I kind of brought out of nowhere this week. I just kind of sent you a Slack message and I said, I got some, I got a bonnet pick. I want to talk about something. Well, I, I got a, I got a, a slight, you know, bone to pick with you. I, I got to say, okay. Is that, you, you know how I'm a big Seattle sports fan. Yep. And. Oh, hello. I picked up the bring back the Sonics shoes here. Are, are we gonna <laughs> and you didn't even, you didn't comment. You didn't I say. Did. The, moment I <laughs> in, the moment I walked in, I said, Oh, shoes. And <laughs> I didn't anyway. point out the green. Uh, because it's a that that's more of an Oakland A's green. Is it? So, it is yeah. A little, yeah, throwing um, you off a little. Yeah, yeah. but I you know respect where respect is due. <laughs> I, that, I love it. Um, does this mean that we're gonna start to up our game on the podcast with regards <laughs> to our fit? And, uh, now, now that I've done that, like every podcast from here on out, you're gonna bring you gotta because you, yeah. you're the you're the sneaker guy. You've got the and I the didn't whole. wear sneakers today. Uh, <laughs> I decided to go for uh, a more simple fit. Okay, well, uh, all right, those are, no, sick. Those I, are I, awesome. I, yeah. So, um, what, what's the problem? Why, why are we upset? Um, well, I kind of threw out a term uh, that I, I, don't, I didn't check online. I didn't do a Google search to see if anyone's ever said this before, but an implementation economy. Uh, and I, the way that, that I came up with that and the, the, the reason I wanted to talk to you about it is because I had a couple of interesting calls this week um, where I was just listening to client stories and listening to how they can't just buy software. There's a whole ecosystem that has to be drawn with them just to buy a piece of technology. And I've experienced this my whole career. You've, you've experienced it in your whole career. You've seen many manifestations of it. And the reason I wanted to talk about it is because I truly believe that that's going to change and that we are at a breaking point in how software is created, sold, experienced, as an end user, and we were talking about it in a previous podcast when it comes to APIs, when it comes to cloud and all of those different things. This is a new angle. This is kind of like looking at the the logistics of buying a piece of software. And I kind of wanted to start with some horror stories because this doesn't just branch into finance, right? This is any case where a large enterprise has a need that they need to fill and they don't have the expertise in house, and it could be for you know procurement of software. That's definitely you know where there's a thriving implementation economy. But there's also other cases, right, where you might not have what you need in house to uh, produce something, whether it's a product or whatever it might be, and you go and you hire consultants to to implement it for you. And I wanted to, I, I have my stories for sure, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to give the first take here. What's the worst? implementation economy <laughs> story that you have uh, in your career that you feel like really hits home with regards to to this experience right as either a software buyer or just kind of being in the thick of it and needing consultants and them really kind of squeezing you when it comes to all the details of a project yeah i mean it uh just uh early on in my career uh just as a controller i think one of the biggest things is just what you're constantly using is ERP systems. Yeah. And if you've gone through an ERP implementation, system selection, uh, these processes are just so Herculean. And in yeah. ERP, it's touching so many different aspects of the business. It, and you have to then incorporate so many different people within right. the business because you have so many different stakeholders. So I think that's kind of the one for any business that becomes one of the hardest things. And it just the attach rate and how the length of time and how – it gets ingrained in you about implementation is that you, ha it's all about the setup. It's all about right. the planning. It's all about uh, understanding all your processes. You've got to do all this stuff. You've got to like clean house and prepare right. for months and months just to get to the starting line of doing that work. And every consulting team will take that. will will tell you about that, but I think it's, so maybe not one specifically it's that, that multiple times, but I think it's also, ingrained because again a big part of you know starting Travada was what was happening at the time in VC circles too it was um it was this whole notion this was right around 2013 2014 was this um a concept of the enterprise inter, or the consumerization of enterprise software right and we know all those enterprise software 
enterprise businesses take a lot longer to get going. Um, they take a lot longer to scale. And then as a result, it's like what started out as something new and innovative, by the time the company really hits maturity, it may be 20, 25 years, and they kind of have to draft yeah. in that. And it's really hard to change software when you're so deep in the journey, which kind of helps or you know propagates that whole thing. But now everything is happening with development cycles and the way everything's architected, everything's changing so fast. So one of the, the concepts of just embracing that right out of the gate was that we never want to build something like that. We, yeah. we know we've got to future proof it and we don't want to get away from that. And the whole thing of like, remember in the early days, it, it would almost like to a fault that I would basically say, you know, you can't say the I word, you know, yeah. implementation is a bad word. We want to, we want to theoretically get rid of that. And yeah. I know maybe we weren't, you know, you know, purely there at that point, but we, for the most part, we really don't have much, but if we could just rid that yeah. from this, you know, enterprise software space, then that would be uh, that would be incredible. You just said something that I I want to latch onto. It's the consumerization of software. I feel like that's a buzzword that gets thrown around often. Just like cloud, when we were talking about it in the last podcast, I have a take on that because I've obviously had an opportunity to play on both sides, on the enterprise software side and on the consumer side. And what I saw right away on the enterprise side, because this is my first rodeo when it comes to enterprise software. So it was interesting to see our competitors and being able to see kind of like how they think through software. And you think when you look at a phrase like consumers, you know, consumer software or consumerization of software, that it'll mean something like, well, it'll look pretty or look at the typography and it's just so modern or you look at the colors and the choices of the palette and that it's just pleasing to the eye. But I actually think it goes way deeper than that because when you're building consumer software, the issue is, is that it's for a very large target audience that has many personas. And so what you have to do is design an experience that kind of works its way down to the lowest common denominator of what the cognitive threshold will be for that targeted tar targeted audience. And so let's say you have an app that you want that end user to be able to figure out how to use and that they have to sign up for the app and set it up in some way. Well, you're incentivized as a builder to make it as easy as possible, as low from a cognitive load as possible and as delightful as possible so that they get to the end goal of using your software, right? It was such a culture shock <laughs> to go into the enterprise space where it's the exact opposite. It's almost as if the software is intentionally designed to be complex to set up and to be unintuitive to the degree that you feel fear. And as a result of feeling fear, you feel the need to get help and help coming from the community that's part of this whole implementation yeah. economy that we're talking about. Uh, you know, fleets of consultants, experts in various niches, right? Because there's not, you, you don't just, you know, go to Upwork and find, uh, hey, I need help with NetSuite, <laughs> right? Yeah. What in what, what kind of help, right? Do you need help in setting yeah. up payments? Do you need help in setting up the entire ERP? How about selecting one? Uh, what kind of industry are you in? Manufacturing? E-commerce? Well, depends because based on that, you might set it up differently. And I can just imagine being in an organization, a finance, you know, traditional finance organization where you have, you didn't go to school to learn how to, you know, think through computer science concepts or software or any of that. And you're faced with these challenges and right, your CFO is basically saying to you, yeah, guys, you're going to have to figure this out. Everybody's going to be on this project for the next six months. And I can see why you would feel like it is a daunting task and you'd want to hire a set of consultants. But here's the issue. And this is where my uh, this is where I, I get upset about this. If you don't have an experience that is intuitive enough for you to at least do the, the initial setup, then you are sacrificing mastery, right? Mm -hmm. yep. From day one. And this is where I've heard the stories and just recently in client call of having generations of implementation folks that were there at the beginning did not provide documentation that codifies that mastery in a way where the next person, whether it's on that finance team in accounting yep. or whoever it might be, could pick it up and say, 
oh, these, this is the reason why we made the decisions that we did in configuring it in this way. Yep. And then you have to work backwards, almost reverse engineer the implementation. And that consultant could be long gone. It's a nightmare. Right? And they're not going to, they might not even be there anymore. It's like customized software. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, where do you pick up? But I think one of the under, you know, how did we even get here? And I think yeah. one of the things, if you look back, you know, over the last 20 years, it used to be what, in order to build enterprise software, it was always about the architecture had to be built for scale. You were right. solving a scale problem. And if you're going to work with a lot of big companies, tons of users within the company, it was always an infrastructure thing that you had to solve. Right. So back in the, you know, pre-cloud, right, you're having to build, you know, all, it was, a, it was a hardware issue. Yeah. And you're having to solve for this compute capacity that you're doing through, you know, lots of different servers and lots of different, you know, uh, the, the technology, the infrastructure to be able to support it. Yeah. And then lots of people to support all of that. But I think what, what, what got really shifted once you got in the, uh, you know, once, um, it was really the consumer platforms that changed the infrastructure right. hang up or the extra. So then it was the Facebooks. It's the Googles because now they're so much bigger coming right. out with wide column models that were just disrupting the classic, like, well, we've got to have Oracle as the underlying database, right. which is all of that, you know, traditional, you know, data structure where now it's wide, all these different, you know, the database had essentially being re reinvented because consumer scale now meant like you had to have, billions of people like with yeah. Facebook and all that. So then consumer software and consumer platforms yeah. actually solved and took the infrastructure problem to, uh, you know, solve that in a, in a very unique way. Yeah. And so I think even the, the legacy hangover of enterprise software that we're still dealing with a lot of these older systems, it's all still on this legacy old hardware that allowed them to do that at scale back then. Yeah. But now it's become the opposite. Now it's become a crutch because now it's so rigid it was built that way, so robust and so rigid to solve those problems for a scale issue. And now it's like, it's a yoke. Yeah. Now you're just stuck this thing. You can't do a lot of stuff with it. You can't maneuver with it. There's no flexibility. And, and all of that now, when everything is moving lightning fast, speed of information, all the thing, and we need things in real time. We want to get cash, liquidity, all these things that you right. want from a, from, you know, from a user experience now has to drive on modern infrastructure, which again, you know, so at leapfrog, consumer leapfrog enterprise, and now enterprise, I think everybody thinks that, oh yeah, consumer, back in the old days, it was like, oh, consumer has, you know, you can have really nice pretty charts because you don't have to, you know, you put it on a very simple infrastructure <laughs> stack. Yeah. And now it's like, and I think honestly, this is a little bit why you see even, you know, older legacy software industries like the TMS space, when they look at Travada as a new entrant, they're thinking, oh, they'll have scale challenges. They'll start to hit the wall because yeah. they won't have the robust infrastructure that we have. And it's like, no, it's absolutely the opposite. Yeah. Like we now have the new infrastructure that allow us to just blow past you and, and we're coming. We're, we're built on the platform that runs Amazon.com. Yeah. So. And this enterprise <laughs> software stack, yeah. you're going to sitting and you're literally flat-footed right. and you're going to watch, you know, like a Travada or a new player just kind of, race right by you because they can i so it feels like there are cycles at play in enterprise software you would have probably been super impressed you know 10 15 years ago when sap was able to you know bring software to life that lets a mega blue chip like amazon or you know walmart or any of them that does enormous scale, almost incomprehensible scale, run digital, you know, analytics and do all of that and do it on-prem or do it in a private cloud and all of that. And at the time, I could see why it was very impressive, right? Because cloud didn't exist back then yep. in a meaningful way. So you would have to have an implementation team to bring that to life because, as you said, it's all custom. Yep. You have to kind of define what is your requirement, you know, set for running this software, where is it going to be based, who's going to use it, all of that. And if you're Walmart or Amazon, it's huge. The requirements are incredible. And so you need a team of people that are thinking through that. Fast forward, cloud, consumerization of software, new concepts with regards to how users interact with software. We are all used to, you know, iPhones, you know, Android devices, Google 
the Facebooks of the world, we know how to navigate complex onboardings. We know how to set things up. We like customizing things now. And it's happened slowly but surely over a decade, you know, plus, and we're in a completely different spot. Additionally, here's the other thing that I, I have a bone to pick with. <laughs> Mo- these monolithic mega apps, right? I feel like that's another trend, right? It started where it made sense from a software sales perspective for you to say, hey, we check literally every box. You buy this one piece of software and you get everything. And you look now at our behavior as consumers, I'll open anybody's iPhone. I, you could give me your iPhone right now. I guarantee you will have multiple apps for the same thing, and it's because you're super comfortable with one app being really good at one thing and another app being good at another thing. And navigating between the two, why? Because you prefer the experience of one over the other, and you're fine with having multiple apps and jumping in between them and having notifications for one versus the other. It's just normal now, right? We don't need super apps that do everything for us, and it's because we've gotten used to this approach where if I need a, 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 a problem and a niche to be solved, I just get an app, and it'll solve the problem for me. I don't need to go and find the right app that has all the features that I need across every possible use case. Why? You don't need to. You have a thriving app economy that is able to give you that. So that's interesting to me because when you look at the ERP space, when you look at the TMS space especially, it's super apps. It's apps where you have to literally have every checkbox checked in order to buy it and feel like you get value out of it. But then what happens is, do you actually use all of those features? Right. Do you set them up even? And then it's like, what are you really paying for? But the company needs you to pay for all of them. You and need that's to pay the for problem. Them. Yeah. And I think that's the thing when you're when you're bound into this old world infrastructure model and it's legacy software like that, then all of the the engineering to kind of meet the demands of customers in that paradigm is you're constantly having to it's almost like you're hard coding these features and right. it's feature on top of feature on top of feature. But what you're doing, even if you are listening to the customer and adding those in, it takes a long time to add them because of the, of the trickle down effect all the way right. down to the root level of the data model. And, and then if there's anything dynamic coming in to account for that is really, really hard. So right. that rigidity becomes this, this crutch and you're having to uh, constantly you know, add new things in that environment. So then on the flip side, if you look at one of the most now scalable and robust infrastructure, uh, uh, you know, models on the planet, if you, a good example that we all know is, is Apple. Right. So we all have iPhones. There's billions and billions of these devices out there. I don't know how many iPhones do you think? Almost 2 billion now, for two, sure. It's so it's like, insane. you know, one third of humanity has yeah. one, you know. It's, it's crazy. So if you think of that too, like you say, all the apps it's the app layer becomes neat. You can basically just, you know, if you don't like it, throw it away. New app. You're constantly changing things yep. out because our behaviors and our, 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 what we need from a user perspective is changing so dynamically and right. so fast. And then the infrastructure to support it, though, is, 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 is crazy good, right? So if you think of Apple now, we're constantly getting releases, new software releases, yeah. and even whether you're a MacBook user, all that is now tied into on the same kind of network. So when you look at rolling out these, uh, you know, these constant things, that's where the infrastructure has moved to, but it has not, you can't really do that on that on the legacy software because it's all monolithic tied end to end. Right. So if right. you kind of look at more of a modern tech stack, it's built with incredible amount of, of, of robustness and on the infrastructure, and it enables this really nimble, flexible, yeah. like build it, throw it away. Or we could build multiple kind of user experiences for multiple different, you know, users in terms of what they want without sort of this infrastructure penalty that you've got to be constantly contending with. And, and that's what makes it so exciting because now you can, you know, just like Apple rolls out a new release every, how often, maybe three weeks, or there's some dot, you know, absolutely one, five, and or whatever, right? The other thing, too, and that's a great point that you just made, that's another transition that happened in uh, the, the world of technology is that we went from super apps to the rise of platforms and marketplaces. 
what used to be a very centralized experience now has been replaced with a decentralized platform oriented experience where you benefit as a software maker if you can create a thriving economy right of developers of applications of use cases that all take advantage of your platform right and i think that that's another thing that is super important here is that by having this decentralization folks probably think that well that's a bad thing because then you ha- you 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 can't learn anything you know and and you don't have uh, the ability to centrally manage things but that's where the platform comes into play because when you think of apple they don't let it become this wild west where security is lost where entitlements and privileges are lost where any of those things get compromised no they handle those basics at the platform level so that you have the peace of mind of knowing that i can install any app and my privacy will be intact my security will be intact. I don't have to worry about what that app will do. And it's because Apple has my back because yep. they have made the promise that if I engage in the app store, they're going to do this, 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 and this for me. They're going to help me you know, transact and buy these, these, the software. They're going to update it. They're going to do the security, all those things. So getting back to kind of this implementation economy angle, yeah. I think that what has happened is that because we're in these cycles and they're, they're long cycles, that's, clear to me now that they can last a decade plus maybe even 20 years in the case of of the tms space it's really difficult to break those cycles because of the implementation economy yep because what takes place is that these kind of barriers start to get placed in front of buyers in front of uh, operators that are using that software and it's because the implementation economy is incentivized to effectively remove all mastery from the end user. The more that they do that, the more that they create this reliance, the more that they will get more kind of billable hours and, and all of that. Now, I, don't, I, I want to dispel one thing right away. I don't have anything against consultants. I actually was one. You know, <laughs> my first job in my career was doing that. And it was fun. And yeah. you, got, you get to solve interesting problems yep. for customers. And there's a delight in doing that. What I don't like is when customers are taken advantage of because of the fact that you have knowledge that they don't. And at the end of the day, this is where my gripe lies, is that as a software builder, you know, we are, we feel like we're master builders of software. You have a very real obligation to make a a decision. Mm -hmm. Where, Where do you stand on this subject? Do you want to create mastery in your end user? Do you want to give them freedom to operate? Do you want to allow for them to be delighted in your experience and feel empowered to learn when new features come out? Or are you doing the opposite? Are you creating an experience where it intentionally suppresses that mastery so that the implementation economy can thrive and anytime new features come out, anytime new configurations come out, it means that you have to hire a new wave to educate your team to get things set up and all of that. And I, I'm really upset about the well, state I think of the there's, industry. There's two different, I mean, I think consultants are in some ways needed more than ever. Yeah. But I think there's a huge shift that's taken place over the last 10 years that's caused this kind of divergence. Um, you've got a group of consultants, I mean, who make a living, a lot of consultants who make a living off installing these legacy right. platforms and maintaining them because they're a real bear to maintain. Like you, you look at any... Uh, if it's an Oracle on-prem ERP system, yep. uh, you're, you're, if you're a big company, you're likely going to have at least two to three dedicated uh, system administrators. All they do is focusing on, you know, uptime, you know, uh, just data resiliency, all the kind of things just to maintain that that system right. is always going to be on and working, you know, at its, at its maximum potential. So then if you kind of look at, and there's consultants that are always doing that for other, other companies too implementing these systems so all of a sudden now when you get this shift to something different like those folks then have to evolve to kind of the new world order right. too and that's and there's some that just you know there's always going to be this long tail needed to support these systems but if if they're not changing or adapting as that market's starting to kind of go get smaller then you know in some ways there's a bias to make sure they can kind of propagate that because that's how their livelihood is gained. right there's other folks though who are, are focused on really, you know, focusing on what's best for the, the user and we'll continue to navigate in that in that kind of new economy of what 
and, and sort of future proof the journey it, with on a newer platform to help them with that that longevity. And that's yeah. and there's more of shifting over there. A good example is when um, in the early days of cloud, um, you saw uh, you know when cloud came and AWS was really gaining a, a head of steam. Now kind of finding its way in the enterprise world, there was sort of this fear. Uh, from if you're an IT person, yeah. thinking it's just a little bit like now the fear coming with yep. AI. It's like, hey, am I going to still have a job? Is right. this you know cloud thing AWS going to put me out of business? And it it was actually the opposite because what happened was the folks you know if you look at now, nobody hires network administrators. Why? Because nobody has servers in the back room right. or your own server you know data center in your in your office uh, environment. And so network administrators maintaining all those servers. They basically mapped over, probably went to an AWS, you know, reInvent conference. They, Only and they, one company hires them. <laughs> it's Amazon yeah. well, or, or Google. <laughs> they, they basically became cloud architects. Right. And they're now working at all these different companies, whether, you know, you know we have, uh, you know, a specialization in those areas. So many other companies are building platforms or software specialization. Companies need those as well to navigate all from an IT perspective. It just, the profession changed, uh, you know, and they, they just pivoted. So learning new things and learning the new way. And I think that we're still traversing that on the consulting. So you have yep. some that are still kind of these old systems that you can't quite put out to pasture yet because there's so much reliance, but new software is coming in. It's creeping in. And, and the, the, another example is when we actually, you, you remember there's a company won't, you know, name names, but, um, we were talking to the um, the treasury team, and yeah. uh, they definitely were excited. They they saw the user experience, but who got really energized with is was on the second call when there was actually the CIO and a couple other tech folks right. on the call. And when they saw it, they basically on the call talked to the 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 treasurer and said, "Can we replace our you know our old large system like exactly. now?" And just because. All of the, you know, IT folks who have, which most now have already crossed over, they don't want to support these old systems. Yeah. They want to support something exactly. that's new. And so when they saw it, I, I think, and that was one of the things we talked about, like, yeah, maybe we should actually just, you know, sell to the technology teams because our job would be that much easier because right. they see what we're doing and all the things it enables. And so I think therein lies this, you know, this interesting just journey made me we're on. think of a story. Do you remember, okay, let's rewind the tape, uh, Three years ago, three and a half years ago, when we first launched Search. Was that three and a half years ago? Pretty much. Remember how the first few customers that started playing with Search and uh, our principles of reporting, how there was almost like this tentative, almost, I'm afraid to create things because is it going to like mess up the system if I have too many of them? And it, we, we had to keep repeating something over and over, which was there is no penalty for being creative. Go ahead and yep. make as many tags, create as many reports, create as many dimensions as you'd like because we want you to be inspired. We want you to use this to be strategic. And it was so interesting to me, and I, I still think about this, is that a very real barrier that we face as software designers is not just the ability to understand our software, it's the baggage that you might have from whatever previous software that you were using. And this goes back to the implementation economy. That whole generation, we're talking 10, 15, 20 years here of end users that are used to that behavior of having to work with a consultant, yep. they set it up, and now they just have a report. They have a dashboard, they go, they trust it, and they yep. don't think at all beyond that. They don't have curiosity to set up things for themselves. They don't have this nimble, hey, my CFO asked a question in a meeting. I think I know how I could solve that. Let me go find the data, plug it together, maybe run a report, and then I can solve that problem in a few minutes. Yep. That doesn't exist because there's a fear that you might break something, that you might cause an issue with the standard dashboards that you have or whatever it might be. That, to me, is... It's kind of missional, right? Yeah. We're, we, we, we wake up to break that, to break that cycle. And I really feel strongly about this because at the end of the day, the next generation of thinkers yeah. in finance have to have this behavior. You just well, mentioned they do. Like, 
Right. Yeah, if you think of even my, you know, I've kind of grown up through tech. And for me, being in startups for most of my career, like I have to, you know, evolve and I have to reinvent right. myself every few years because things are changing so much. If I don't, I'm, you know, uh, I'm in trouble, right? I can't do what I do. And so I think, um, but when you look at these dependencies, it's almost like there's a, there's these behavioral aspects of doing your job right. that you, you have, you just know it takes a long time to set up. So you're right. like, I'm not even going to bother. Cause if right. I do that, I'm going to be down a rabbit hole. I'm going to spend all my whole day, you know, tinkering with some report and get it right. And then I can do my routine again. And that is kind of what, what exists when you're on an older legacy platform because of the things we're talking about now, but that's in the, in the new environment, you get this nimbleness where you just don't, you know, don't have to do that. Right. And I think there is, like you said, when we launched search, all of a sudden you start using it. It's like, that was kind of cool. You get this, you know, really cool discovery moment. Right. Light bulbs go off. You start playing around a little bit more. And then all of a sudden you realize, you know, it's, it's probably like maybe, you know, Rapunzel being locked up in her <laughs> castle. Right. You get out in the, in this wide green open field. and You're like, Oh my goodness, this is, this is really, really cool. And we, as the designers of the software, have massive cognitive dissonance in that scenario because we're watching the end user going, I don't get it. It's so easy. Like, just use it, you know? But I think when you, when you treat with respect the psychological background, where they came from, how they have been doing their job for years, how they feel that they have a level of mastery and trust their own skill set, that's where you start to get into these interesting design challenges, right? And you, you know this. Uh, I'm going to give a shout-out to my brother who's, you know, a freshly minted uh, CPA. He's doing his first consulting gig right now. So he awesome. is a consultant. And what's interesting is watching his generation. When he graduated, he obviously had to go through the same things you went through, right? Same tests, all of that. However, a new requirement was you have to learn programming. And I was like, what? <laughs> what for? And what he walked me through was, well, we're being taught how to do query languages like SQL so that we can do our own searching of a database. We don't need engineers to help us with that. Um, we know how to use uh, graphical analysis tools. So, you know, being uh, able to do reporting in Tableau and stuff like that. And we're also being taught how to interact with APIs so that we can plug them into Google Sheets. And when I saw that, I thought to myself, this next generation paired with even tools like ChatGPT and all of these yeah. other things that are coming out, you should be it's, worried. It is right? crazy. Yeah. You should be worried because they have a, a, a set of principles that are guiding their thought process that is enabled through creativity, through exploration, through technology, and they're not going to have any barriers, right? So they're just going to accelerate through this kind of yep. uh, uh, learning curve and get mastery because they're used to it. And so I really think that this is an important principle. Like we have to break through this barrier of yeah. the implementation of economy. And it's not because we're just trying to save people money. It actually has yeah. nothing to do with that because th like you said, there's still complex software that needs to be implemented. And there are things outside of just the user experience that we haven't even talked about. Like for yeah. example, in the banking world, it's still very frustratingly complicated yep. to connect to certain banks, yep. right? Yep. APIs are great. We, we're, you know, on the, the forefront of that. And when they're available, they're magical. Yep. And, and, and it's great. But guess what? Still. Most banks don't have them. Yep. So that means that there's still a need for having experts that know how to interact with the SWIFT network or with, you know, file-based reporting and, and, and the host-to-host -host systems. Yes, of course, there's always going to be that need. But on the software side, on, on the mastery and, and kind of the, the value part of the software, yeah. if you don't have a team that is incentivized to learn, to thrive, to continue to innovate, right. then you're on the wrong path as, as a finance community. Well, and I think that's, that's where I, you know, I could just say, because I lived through it, you know, there's, there's hope for, right. you know, I think, the, you know, maybe older generations will look at that and say, okay, how am I going to, you know, compete with this, all this stuff coming, AI and right. or you know, this younger generation, they're just getting equipped and everything's native to them where it's now maybe a little harder for me. But I, I can just say, like, once you kind of start to cross over a little bit, yeah, it requires you to lean in and learn some of that. But it's it's definitely learnable. I mean, it's not right. like these are barriers that like you can't, 
it, it just requires a little bit of learning to kind of get through. Once you do, I would say in some ways you get the, you know, companies get the best of both worlds because they get, there is so much of this wisdom experience, experience by doing for so many years. And, and there's so much knowledge uh, to, to kind of be harnessed. And then once it sort of gets weaponized on how to tap into that, I just look at it for my, my, my whole career, you know, in finance has always been, you know, CPA controller, you know, finance track, but in startups. And so there's always kind of pressing the envelope a little bit of, you got to learn new things and how to, so it's this notion of like, it's kind of playing, you know, you're always managing risk, which you have to do. Right. Yeah. Uh, and there's that notion of playing defense, but then there's this other aspect though of playing offense. And that's where I still think just be playing because you're playing offense doesn't mean it's aggressive or dangerous right. or putting you in these. It's actually the, the opposite. I think the, the mode was what I would want to do is I, I wanted to know exactly where those really hard risk areas were. I kind of carve out, it's almost like you're carving out the, the ring around you yep. and you know, that's where the cliff edge is. But within that, if you had that, a lot of precision around that, then you could know, you could have a lot of freedom to operate knowing you're, you can be, you know, a little more aggressive, but within that area, that, that play area. Right? right. So, and that's the thing you're, you're actually doing things. It's helping your company or, you know, finding, you know, areas of improvement or efficiency or uh, just ways to optimize in so many different levels. But if you're not thinking that way, which now the, the beauty about it is all the new tools yep. equip you to do that. And so my whole career having to do that with, you know, not a lot of good tools. And so is hard. Right. And but now more than ever, it sort of democratizes all of that. So anybody can do that. And, and you're you're enabled and equipped to be able to do that better, faster, more capable than ever, uh, than, than ever. And if you've got all of this, you know, knowledge about how to do it, that's accumulated over the years, like it's that much better. So now it's, you get the best of both worlds doing all of that. It just requires you to lean in. It, it, it's more native for, you know, younger folks who just have been brought up into that, but then they might be lacking all of the knowledge and things of how to do stuff, or maybe they haven't made enough mistakes to kind of learn from some of those things. Oftentimes, you know, that's where that wisdom is, is, is gained. Yeah. But I think between the two or even working together, that's why it's so cool to kind of have this cross collaboration too. Absolutely. Is because it's challenging each other. You know, uh, the younger generation is learning from folks who've been in the trenches in a different way. And, and the, the, the older generation is kind of learning, you know, these new tools and how to get, you know, how, how, what the younger generation is kind of brought up on. And I think that's just where it's, it's, it's super cool because then everybody is learning and, Everybody is kind of, you know, that that aspect of teaming, which we always, you know, talk about culturally is just so, so cool and so powerful. You know what I think is important in that context is trust. One of the things that if if you have that kind of teaming going on in your organization and there are folks that do feel comfortable in an environment where they're exploring, they're trying something new. This is why the current state of SaaS, I think, is sto so exciting. And it's for me. When it comes to purchasing software, it is a lot about trusting the software provider. And everybody thinks that the, you know, the first layers of that are related to security. Of course they are. They're related to privacy. What are you going to be doing with my data? How are you going to be scaling what I'm doing? So yes, of course, that has to be the first layer. But believe it or not, for me, and I have bought a lot of software at Travada, you have too. Uh, the first thing that I look for is... Will you allow for me to get in there and see for myself whether or not this is going to be valuable? And if you don't, I immediately have a reason to believe that you have something that you're hiding. Because if you're not willing to let me sign up and try it, then that means that either A, you just don't have a modern piece of, of software that is capable of doing that. And you haven't gotten to a point where you can create an experience that is that kind of dynamic. And when I think of, you know, the greatest SaaS, SaaS softwares, Intercom, Zendesk, all of these pieces of software where they literally let you sign up sa same day, you set it up, you see the value, and boom, you're off to the races. And the reason is because they have nothing to hide. They're very clear on what they're offering in terms of value. And they're saying, don't believe us? Try it Try right it now. <laughs> and, if, and we're so confident that you're going to love it that we're going to just let you use it, Right. And it works. Why? Because it's creating this trust cycle where you're incentivized as the user to find out for yourself. You get the mastery on their software because you're basically 
checking. You're checking the receipts, right? They said that they can do this. Can they? Oh, wow. It does. Oh, this does what they said that it does. This is going to save me a lot of time. And here's where the trust in the teaming inside of your community happens yeah. too. Because if you're someone that feels comfortable doing that exploration, then you can go to the team and say, guys, I signed up for this piece of software. It was free. Here's what I learned. It gets us this, this, and this. And if we pay for this you know, subscription fee, it'll get us this. That kind of behavior, in my opinion, is an evolution of how you should be interacting with software. Yeah. Why? Because it's built on the foundations of trust. It's the yep. antithesis, right, of yep. the implementation economy. Because with the implementation economy, it's here is this very long laundry list of things that we can do. Trust us. Yep. And by the way, you're going to have to hire a team to get you to that space. Trust us, though. Yeah. You'll get the value, right? Yeah. What a different experience. That's Isn't crazy. that crazy? It is crazy. And I think, you know, you're, uh, as we traverse across these, you know, uh, th through kind of this new world order, it, it, uh, it's imperative. I mean, I think, like I say, you know, younger generation, they, they'll only buy that way. Right. And I think there's this other still, maybe a little bit of skepticism from an older generation to say, well, if it's, it feels too easy, it feels almost, then therefore it must be not as secure. Right. Or there's something not as robust about it. And, and again, there's too many, too many things we could start to, to, to draw from in terms right. of consumer platforms that says, well, that's not true. You know, Apple, like we talked about and others, but I think that what, what now starts to happen is, is, and I, and I learned kind of early on from a, a mentor of mine in the startup world, uh, that in, in sales, in, in, a, in an enterprise world, when you're dealing with disruption and kind of disrupting, you know, the legacy side of things is that um, if you can't convince them, confuse them. And I think, unfortunately, that is happening a lot. Yeah. Is because yeah. You, if you're, you're an enterprise software, you've been around for 25, 35, 40 years, you just, you simply can't do what a newer platform does. You just can't. Yeah. And so what are you going to do as a business? Like, well, you have to, you can't replatform. It's too expensive. It's going to take way too long. Uh, it's probably going to cannibalize some of your margins. So if you, if you look at that, you, you have to keep it going. And eventually it's all going to catch, you know, the music's going to stop. Eventually right. it's going to catch up to you. And so you want to be able to kind of prolong that as long as you can. You want to keep your customers on your platform as long as you can until they finally kind of the pain is high enough or they truly know that they're missing out on not being, you know, on the offense to take right. advantage of these new things to where they're finally, you know, leave these older platforms. And that's when they finally kind of get put out uh, to pasture. But that, I mean, that's what's happening. I think part of, you know, why even talking about this is really helping to educate, you know, the buyers. In the enterprise world or, you know, the sales, um, different kind of sales methodologies in selling, there's, you know, looking at, you know, one of them is um, like with Miller Hyman, it's the, you know, you, you look at the uh, approaches to selling, the user buyer, the economic buyer, and the technical buyer. Yeah. And I think, you know, in the, in the treasury space, you often get, you know, obviously the economic buyer, or the economic buyer and the user buyer yeah. sometimes are the same. Right. Uh, right. But still, there's still missing out on the, the technical buyer. It's still kind of looking at all feature function and then not these aspects and then, you know, wondering, you know, not even realizing this, the, you know, that this, they can even do these things because yeah. uh, nobody's telling them about it. And, and they're not asking these hard questions because they just don't know, like, the things that we're talking about. They, I think they intuitively know, all right, it's, everybody complains about it, the user interface is terrible, or it's clunky, or I asked for that feature, and it, it gets there a year later, or it's never going to get there. And, but this is really the reasons why. And at the end of the day, like, it, you're, these older platforms, they're, I shouldn't even call them platforms, they're more of this older software um, uh, model, it just, it's never going to get there. And right. if you're never going to get there, then, you know, at some point you, you have to start to make a move. This has felt good. I'm starting to feel like this is almost like our treasury therapy <laughs> podcast, <laughs> just kind of dissecting this industry, thinking through why it needs to change fundamentally in so many different ways. This one has been on my heart for a while because we've been on this journey for years at this point. We've seen it on the front lines. We're faced with it pretty much every time we have a sales conversation. 
And I think that it's important for us to get our perspective out there because at the end of the day, you know your software provider best when you look at their leadership and their philosophy, what they believe. And the we believe of Travada is that you should not have to buy or experience software in that way. Right. And, you know, don't believe us? Check it out for yourself. Yeah. Right? Yep. And that's the, you know, that's the truth of it. And at, at the end of the day, we're hoping that we're going to make a change in the industry, one customer at a time, one story at a time, and that that will spawn those same customers then telling, you know, their colleagues and working through, you know, their community and realizing, guys, even if you're on a, an older piece of software, what's preventing you from checking to see if there's a better way of doing things, especially if there is a way to do it with low risk, right? Yeah. Zero penalty. You, you can try it for yourself. And that's just the, the, the new way of buying software. And you know what? I'm not going to apologize for having come up, you know, with a way to do this. And we shouldn't, I think, ever be apologetic about improving the experiences of our, of our end customers. And so you're right. You know, th the phrase that you just gave of like confusion, a lot of the time what we see in our space is that because you can't compete on these principles, because we're not talking about features here. This is not like... Apples to apples comparing right. feet. We're talking about fundamental philosophy yeah. about how software should be, right? Yep. And uh, you, like you said, you can't change that unless you completely take it apart and rebuild it. And so what is your only other tactic as an alternative? It's to confuse, to deny, uh, to provide uh, maybe misinformation yeah. in the space. And there's a lot of that, unfortunately. Well, it's it's like, you know, it's like if you're going to, be an athlete, do you want cement in your shoes? Right. I mean, you're not going to be able to move around very much. I mean, there's certain things you could probably still sit out in the three-point line and, and, and shoot and, 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 and make some shots, but you're not going to be, you know, uh, uh, be able to kind of drive, drive in for a layup very right. easily without <laughs> every defender getting on you. So I think that's sort of, I think people are now seeing it. There are these, they're sort of weighted down with these things and you just, you know, the, you, you have to, I mean, more than ever. Yeah. Like, the, the world and whatever you believe, you all, you, you can recognize that there's changes going on in the world. And like, you need to be nimble. Like Absolutely. you need to be ready. You need to, you, it, it's, it's, it's hard to traverse with all the different elements going on in whatever phase in life or in not, not, you know, not just in treasury and finance, but I, I think, you know, all of that, that mentality comes to this, like you have to, you don't want to be, you know, wearing this heavy, medieval chainmail armor to right. go into battle anymore. It's like, that's not the way you're going to, you're going to do it. You've got to have, you got, you got to be more lightweight. Your armor will be more protective. You look at the, like the upgrades in the military with how they, yeah. they like, it's just, it's so different. You've got to have that nimbleness to be able to, uh, to kind of do what you do. And I think we're, we've entered the new era. What's, what's so interesting. And I mean, we, yeah, we're, we're kind of like, helping folks like hit the freedom button it's like right exactly we want to set you free and this is what how everybody should be you know operating um but i think that's um uh, anyway that's 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 where everything's uh headed and and it just it, it's just a matter of time you know and and we're going to start to make our move up market we're yeah. already starting to do it and uh um there are telling this story if you look at still what's going on in the treasury world or in, you know, in enterprise software, it's just, there's still this aspect of, um, do an RFP and it's all feature and function that lines out, yep. you know, users, you know, we're trying to educate our, the, the, the buyers a little bit too. What about all the technology questions? Right. Like, why isn't that, why is that being left out? That's one of the most important things. Again, it's being left out. I think of most RFPs in terms of their focus Yeah. and they get glossed over. Because the consulting ecosystem, it doesn't benefit for them to talk too much about that. Um, if they're talking about a modern, you know, tooling, it's probably going to change, you know, their role. And in that whole thing, are they going to be able to, uh, you know, they're going to have to change yeah. the way they make money in that whole equation. You know, all that stuff is just kind of getting brushed under the carpet right now. It needs to be front and center because at the end of the day, yeah, there's, there's core features and functionality that you have to have for sure. Yeah. Um, but there's this other aspect. If you, if you miss it, you're, you know, you're, you're going to be tying, tying yourself down to, you know, and, and burdened with this where that's not going to allow you to, to really move. Nimbly. Absolutely. And uh, you know, what's funny about the RFP and RFI process is that at the end of the day, 
it's supposed to be helping you. It's supposed to be helping you wade through, well, how many options do I have? And what's the pros and cons of each of them? Instead, what it's doing today is it's adding almost like this additional level of burden for even having the curiosity of exploring for yourself which piece of software will drive value for me. And at the end of the day, if you're making a decision based on checklists and based on uh, a contrived demo at the end of the day from whoever it is that is providing you with that information and you're not seeing it for yourself, Right. Would you buy a car like that? Huh, right. Would you buy like any any other kind of important purchase where you don't get to actually touch it, feel it, drive it, see it, check the receipts? Is this going to do what I think it will? No. Right. And yet, for what is considered, you know, the most important piece of software that many businesses have, yep. that's how it works. It's yeah. literally a total trust fall. Yeah. This is and this it's so cool what I mean it's uh um Travada is meant to, again, we're not just, you know, we are disrupting the treasury space, this old, you know, TMS, 25 years to 45 year old software, right? right. It's, it's just right for innovation. Everybody knows it. Everybody sees it coming. We're on a path. We're going to disrupt it. We're moving up market now. It's going to happen. Yep. Um, but I think the other thing is too, as, as, as this broader platform, a big part of our mission too, because of all the things we're talking about, the way we're architected, is we can help all the other companies that are less than a billion or two billion where that's all that they can do. They might have, they might have to or be able to have the resources right. to buy that. Like now, all these other companies, and there's, you know, arguably we're, millions around the world to we're do that. We're democratizing it. We're saying, why should there be a barrier for any of these companies? There's no barrier. And that's, you look at the, the use of it, overuse of Excel for doing core things. Uh, you look at the over reliance on. Uh, legacy internet banking or online banking uh, that was really brought about, you know, as a website to provide some balances and in, in transactional information. A website. <laughs> it is. It's it essentially was, it a, web, it's still a website. <laughs> it, and it came out in the late 90s because yeah. really the analyst at the time when the internet was starting to come out, all the analysts uh, were, were hitting up the banks and they right. say, hey, you guys need to change. You guys need to be more like media companies. And, and that was the, the pressure analysts were putting on banks. And then banks were responding also, like we kind of like AI. We got it. We don't know what it is. We got to get on this thing. Yeah. And so you, you start to develop what has now become online banking. And, uh, and we got some you know, stories, I think, coming up to talk about that. We should invite a, a, a one John Philpot to tell us about with, how, how you made those websites. <laughs> exactly. And, and that'll be maybe a preview for the next one with yeah. John Philpot, our uh, 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 general partner from FinTop Capital, one of our C investors. Yeah. Uh, he was like employee number four or five of this company, S1, that was really part of that early, you know, the first internet, you know, the bank on the internet and, right. and helping with even that online banking experience very early on. But yeah, it was a, it's sort of a website journey. It hasn't largely changed. So people are asking, well, how do I use online banking? If same cycles. It's the same, yeah. same cycles. And, uh, and arguably, it's even harder because, you know, the, the banks have to contend with so many of these other things. Right. They can't, they're not just like a, a legacy enterprise software company where they could start to incorporate new things. Like the bank has other aspects that they got to deal with from right. a regulatory standpoint. So it's even harder for them. They can't just pivot and become a tech company or add that component easily. So I think when you're, when we're able to add all the things that we do, I mean, we're kind of becoming really a, which is which is hard. It's not easy. It has its pros and cons of really becoming a category builder. Yeah. Because this doesn't what we're building doesn't really exist. And we're helping the bank. We're augmenting and you know building this experience that's automating a lot of these cash workflows that that people don't really know that e it can even be done. So there's still a lot of discovery even even on what Travada is that's happening, and it's just an exciting journey to be part of. All right, let's wrap it up. If you were to give advice uh, to our listeners um, and just give it maybe in a short, sweet couple of bullet points, what would it be? What should you be looking for? I think it's, uh, it's, it's just asking basic questions. I think uh, right away it's asking questions about you know, things that you know. And this is what happens in human nature. You always go to what you know. You ask about what you know. Um, but there's other things when you really start to think about what is best for the company, start to future-proof where we need to go, 
where, where, you know, there are some of those things that are heavy needs, but also start to actually ask some of the, the technology questions, talk to, you know, spend time networking a little bit with other stakeholders in the company. Talk, talk about, uh, talk to your IT group or talk to, you know, maybe a software engineer. They're beyond me because ultimately the decision you're making you might not even be there a few years after the fact, but the company will still be yeah. relying on whatever decision you made. So put a little thought into what the community is, right? That yeah. will be impacted by that decision. And will they be burdened Yeah, because of what you've decided, right? Did you just check a box because it was the one that everybody said you should get? Yeah. Or did you make a decision that really listened to that community and yep. said, hey, look, there are multiple stakeholders here and they all need something. Maybe there is a way to solve their problem. And we've, all, we've always asked this question is like, you know, you don't know what well, you don't know. And, and right. that's the thing. It, it is. It's it's but it you can ask a few questions or talk to a couple of different folks, probably not too uh, far from uh, people already maybe in your circle to ask some of these questions about what does modern tech even mean and, and how yeah. would that support what we're doing? And just a little bit of learnings around that would would be uh, would just go a, a long way. Um, so I think I think the other thing I would say is that. Um, I think you get into the, the cycles of, um, you know, habits and your routine and the systems. And, and it's like we said, it's always been that if you change any of that or you deviate from that, you feel like you're getting off the road and it's going to take all this time to get back. And I guess the message here too is that you can experiment and you can discover in a really easy way. Yeah. And everybody has a, a good, you know, experience with this. When you get on the internet, you see a Google you know, if you're using Google, get on uh, or Bing, you get, you see a search bar and you just, you start typing stuff in. Right. And it's, you realize once you, maybe the very first time you did that, when it first came out is a little bit like, what am I going to type in? And you're a little hesitant, like even to touch it. But once you start doing that, the, it's so natural now to using that and discover all kinds of things. And, you know, all the kind of YouTube self help videos were just, it's just incredible to me now where that's gone. So it, it, there's, there's so much stuff at your fingertips. You, you shouldn't be afraid to experiment and realize that if you just do take a step to just try something, it's not going to set you back like days and right. it's not going to cause hours and hours of time. They're going to have to do th- In fact, once you go down that path, you're going to realize a little bit of time is going to actually pay huge dividends and save you a mass the dividends that it's going to save you in time savings, which is really what everybody wants. So, which is sort of the irony in it. You feel like, well, I don't want to like, like Trevada, I don't want to really try it because I don't have the time to do that. I don't have the time to implement a new system. It's like, no, no, no. The new world order of how to do that now is so different. You, you can actually get in, play around and instantly you will save time instantly, not yeah. like in six months after consultants help you set things up. Not to get too philosophical, but this is the whole principle of embracing discomfort. And I think that this is actually a community that gets really comfortable in their job, right? Where they, they have their way of doing things. They have their mastery, whatever it was. And they get to a point where they just repeat that. But the thing is, what do we learn in our lives is that we become the better versions of ourselves, the best version of ourselves when we embrace discomfort. Think of when you're in sports or when you're in a situation where you have to learn something new. And even physiologically, like what have we learned recently that, you know, you do like cold plunges and things like that. And when your body goes through that side, exactly, your our bodies, our, our way of thinking, everything about a human is about evolving, right? Yeah. Creating those moments of discomfort that allow for you to get that innovative moment, to have that breakthrough, to have that moment of inspiration. If you just let yourself be, right, and keep yeah. going on the same path, well, you're not going to change at all. Yeah. And I think that that, you know, that's a great point, and that's a great piece of advice, is that embracing that, And allowing for yourself to be vulnerable in that way. And really all you have to give is a little time. (laughs) We're not talking about taking a cold plunge here. We're talking about just taking a little bit out of your day to look into something. So, yeah, yeah, that's awesome advice. Um, This has been amazing. Great episode. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad we got a chance to talk through this. Thank you for joining us. This has been Fintech Corner. I'm Joseph. This is Brett. We'll see you next time. (laughs) 